Hi, folks. Welcome to Crisco's Corner. Unfiltered commentary. And that's your truth, the real truth. Please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thank you for your support. Hi, folks. Welcome back. Another part of my continuing, I call, series called Looking for Freedom in America. I went from upstate New York where I live through West Virginia, through Kentucky, started off Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, through Kentucky, through Central Tennessee. And I stayed a week in Crossville where this video is. You see the military museum here. Crossville is a really cool town. If you want to check out some of my thoughts and some videos on the old downtown of Crossville, check out some of my videos uh, from a few days ago. But anyway, this is a video on the Military Museum. Now, this is a really cool place. It's a small museum, but they've got a ton of stuff in there. We're going to try to go through it because it's pretty cool. And all of you out there might be triggered by Confederate stuff. You know what? Grow up. It's part of U.S. history. So this is the museum here, as you can see. And I think it was the former post office in downtown Crossville. Now you'll see there, there's a private 3rd Confederate Cavalry CSA, born in 20, 1821, died, died in 97. And it's an actual tombstone. You see the pennies on there. Now, those of you that are wondering why, you know, I don't want to hear about the Confederacy were traitors and slaveholders and all that nonsense, but it gives you an idea of the meaning of the coins. Now, when I was at Lee's uh, grave or stone in Virginia, they have a little plaque outside underneath it is Traveler Lee's horse. And what each means... Uh, you see, paying out of respect is a penny. Uh, some A nickel means one thing, a dime means another. And then a quarter means something else entirely. And so I thought that was pretty cool. That was at the beginning. As you walk, first walk in, you see it was a really nice oil painting of Lee. And it's uh, it's pretty cool stuff. It's... A lot of it's authentic. Some of it's reproductions. And if you want to stop the video here, it gives you an idea of some of the key events in Tennessee history concerning the Civil War. So if you want to stop and read the whole thing here, you can. And most of our presidents came from Virginia. In fact, I think Virginia is the number one state for U.S. presidents. Now, they go by when you were born there, so... Give you an idea, Woodrow Wilson, who was governor of New Jersey, was born in Virginia, so they count him as where you were born. Not where you might have got famous or became president in the state you lived in. And they give you some small history there on some of the stuff in Tennessee. And Unionists in a Confederate state. Now, this is important because Tennessee was split, as the country was, right down the middle, damn near right down the middle. As you saw from my previous video with the memorial on the CSA and USA soldiers listed in the memorial, they're pretty close. And this is a fairly small county by today's standards. Back then it was really small. And if you saw both sides, they're fairly even in number. And you see some of the same last names. I can almost guarantee you that if you're in a county this small, that... You're probably related if you had the same last name. Either cousin, maybe even brother. Who knows? Uh, second cousin, you were a relation. And you were fighting against each other. And it was uh, civil wars, the ugliest wars. Family fights are the ugliest and most destructive fights. Think of it in your personal family. Some of the most vicious verbal fights and some of the most vicious physical fights are with family members. It's just human nature, and that's the way it is. And you can see some other things here.
Now, there's a really cool picture of Lee. You can tell it was black and white. It was a little bit older. I ended up getting a bust head of General Lee when I was in Chancerville uh, to see the Chancerville battle site. If you want to see the spot, Stonewall Jackson was, was mortally wounded at and some other things at Chancerville. Check out some of my previous videos when I was there. There's oil paintings, and there it is, folks. There's the aftermath of the Civil War in the end. Graveyard after graveyard after graveyard after graveyard. With hundreds of thousands of widows. And probably over a million orphans. And that's the way it was. And so all you people out there that say this country's evil, this country's bad, it's systemic racism, it's this and that, and blah, blah, blah. Almost, they estimate 650,000 Americans died in the Civil War. At the beginning, it was about preserving the Union and states' rights. And then as the death toll got higher and higher and higher, the justification for that kind of carnage, keeping the Union together and states' rights, wasn't, a, wasn't enough for this kind of carnage. So Lincoln and many and fought the war said, this is about freeing men. This is about ending slavery in the United States for all time. Does not mean that everybody that fought in the Confederacy was racist and believed in slaveholding. They were like anybody else. Uh, no more than the black soldier in World War II that was in France fighting the war was fighting for Jim Crow and racism. Of course not. He was an American. Some of the best pilots, if you see some of the movies that are out in World War II, were black squadrons. And in the end, in the end, even some of these Southern racists that were in World War II wanted these guys to escort them I request they earn their respect and honor. So history is a lot more gray than it is black and white. And things aren't always what they seem. And you see the picture on the left there of the painting. One with the blue hat on and one with the gray hat on, looking down at all the bodies. There had to be something higher in purpose for that kind of carnage. And it was carnage. Where I live in upstate New York, there's about 45,000 people. I live in Binghamton, which is in just below Syracuse, above the Pennsylvania border. More people were killed and wounded at Gettysburg than there are a number of people in my city, and there's over 45,000. It was the largest battle ever fought, Gettysburg, in the Western Hemisphere. And thank God, to this day, it's still the biggest. And my understanding at Gettysburg, on the third day, when Lee made that fatal mistake, fatal, fatal mistake, that was the turning point of the war, also known as Pickett's Charge, when he had Alexander, their artillery chief, bombard the Union Center. My understanding is the, the loud noise that was made by this humongous cannon artillery barrage was the loudest sound noise ever made by a human being up until the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. Think about that for a minute. And they go through the rest of it here. Uh, a lot of cool stuff. You can stop this at any time if you want to read these. Now, this was pretty cool. They had some really cool models of, of boats, ships, metal. I mean, they weren't ironclads, as they called them. And there was a submarine there you see on the right. It was the beginning of the ironclads. And, in fact, when the monitor of the Merrimack event, they said all of Europe looked down in horror and all the militaries in the world because every single Navy 
was now obsolete because they were all made out of wood. In a lot of ways, the Civil War was the training ground for technology and tactics for World War I, which, of course, we know was absolutely horrendous and killed millions. And there's some of the uh, models. They're really well made. Whoever did these used to know what they were doing. They're probably out of scale, I have no doubt. Now, there's a different flags. Now, everybody freak out. Uh, uh. Well, on the right, well, on the left's the old Revolutionary War flag. And there's one in the center. But do you recognize the one on the right? For those of you that don't know, that is the Confederate flag. Before it was 13, it was 13 stars in the end. The cross, the stars and bars, as they call it, was not the Confederate flag. I repeat, it was not the Confederate flag. It was their battle flag. And there it is there. The battle flag is on the right. The reason why they changed to the stars and bars for the battle flag is from a distance, as you can see, from far away, the American flag and the Confederate flag look very much alike. And sometimes you would march towards the wrong people with disastrous results. And in a way that's symbolic to the fact that the flags look the same because they were all Americans. And they all loved their country. I think that the South, seceding from the Union, firing on Fort Sumter, was one of the biggest miscalculations and blunders in U.S. history. And I think the Civil War was the biggest disaster to befall the United States to date. And I hope nothing surpasses that. If you wanted to use today's numbers in population percentages, it would be over six and a half million Americans died. That's not counting the destruction of lives economy was in shambles in the South. It set back the South a hundred years economically. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster. And it was a disaster for the country in total, but especially for the South. It was a huge miscalculation. I don't know why it's a little blurry there. Maybe it's just my camera work, but and there's a cool looking, that's a reproduction, obviously, of a Civil War uniform. But they're pretty cool looking, to be honest with you. And a can in there. And it's like I said, it's a fairly small museum, but they got a lot of cool stuff in there. All and they got it, they got it laid out pretty well. It's um very neatly done. There's a cannon. The vast majority of the things in here, the gentleman that one of the tour guides told me was was all donated. Almost all of it was donated. And there's some of the pistols. Like I said, if you want to stop the video and read, now there is the real Confederate flag. With seven stars, two red and one white stripe. Now the other one you saw was a reproduction. The tour guide told me this. This is a authentic Confederate flag flown in the early 1860s in the Confederate States. And that was pretty awesome. It's pretty beat up, but it's part of our history, like it or not. It's about who we are today. There's a really cool picture of Lee, who they adored. Brilliant tactician. There you have a Oh, I got a little wacky. Oh, got a good picture of my feet there. There's a uniform. And that's a real one because it was behind glass. Now, that kid in the window, I thought he was just a kid in there. He ended up being a tour guide. He was very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. And all the tour guides there are volunteers. And um, I was telling him, give me a favor. I'm trying to film. Keep the sound down, if you would. I didn't realize at the time that he was a tour guide. I just thought he was a... Young kid, I like to talk. And then uh, there's uh, some clothing there and back to the ships at a different angle, a different light. 
And we'll go around here and see some of the things that are in the museum. Very cool place. If you get a chance to go there, I suggest that you do. Admission is free. You can leave a donation on your way out, and I did. I went there twice during the week I was in Crossville, and I left $20. I thought that was more than worth the two or three hours that I spent in there. And back to that picture early again. Now you're going to see some um, video because I was there on two different occasions. You might want to see some of the same. There's Stonewall Jackson and Lee. Some of these mir some of these paintings are very well done. And we're back to the back to the private Yancey because I had to go back a second time because the battery wore out. Now there's Edmund Ruffin, father of secession in Virginia. He supposedly fired the shot on Fort Sumter. You might see him if you ever see the movie Gods and Generals and where they asked Robert E. Lee to lead the Virginia Army at the beginning of the war. He's one of the really long white hair. At the end of the war, he killed himself. He shot or killed himself with a shotgun. Said he did not want to be part of the Yankee race. That's uh, pretty hardcore. And some other pictures. Now, if you remember Sergeant York, we're going to see him coming up soon. And you'll see him there. Uh, there's some pictures. That's all the same picture. He was the drummer boy. Yeah, this is when I go to stop it, it makes the picture blurry. But uh, that's him from a boy all the way through until he got older. It's the same gentleman. And now we're going into World War I almost. We're getting there. And there's a World War I picture. I should say that's not World War I. That's Spanish-American War. We're starting to get into that now. And some other things that were donated from the Spanish-American War. There's a really cool-looking uniform, the suspenders and the hat, which is a Spanish-American War. That's why they call Tennessee the volunteer state. Now you see Sergeant York there, or kind of. And there's some currency from the old Confederacy. The Confederate seal. Uh, the state of North Carolina had their own currency, $1. Banks, banks gave out their own currency back then, even in the north. Uh, there's an old story that I saw, if you ever watch uh, The Civil War by Ken Burns, or Shelby Foote, the historian, uh, said that supposedly the story goes, Jefferson Davis was walking through the streets of Richmond one day, and a young man stopped him and said, Sir, you be in Jefferson Davis? He says, Yes, I am. He says, I thought so. You look just like him on the postage stamp. <laughs> so... Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't edit out that part, but you're going to see my feet every once in a while. And there's some pictures from the Spanish-American War. It's um, Sergeant York. No. Everybody remember Sergeant York, the movie? I'm trying to remember the gentleman that played him in the old movie. He wasn't from Crossville. He was about maybe 15, 20 miles north of Crossville. But if you see in the movie... When he gets back from World War I after winning the Congressional Medal of Honor, it says Crossville, Tennessee. That's where the railroad station was. So he was a local boy, Cumberland County boy, very famous. But there was another gentleman that did just about the same thing Sergeant York did. Took out seven or eight German machine gun nests. And the only reason why he didn't get a lot of fame, even though he did win a Congressional Medal of Honor as well, because he was killed in a line of duty, and Sergeant York wasn't. And he was a conscientious subjector at the beginning, believe it or not. I believe he was Quaker. He ended up saving hundreds of men and winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
So Warren has some interesting stories to be sure. And you'll see there a lot of, like I said, stop the video whenever you want to. It's just pictures of volunteers and soldiers from Cumberland County, which Crossville is in. And those of you that believe that America is not such a great place, the world would be a much different place if it wasn't for the United States and their military. World War I. Without America in World War I, God knows what would have happened. God knows what would have happened in World War II. I personally believe we saved Europe twice. That's just my... Now, this is a model so we made the USS Missouri. Now, look how cool this is. You might want to stop the video and check out some of this detail. I could have went a little slower probably, but that is a really, really amazing-looking model. Look at that. I mean, it's unbelievable. And that was donated to the museum. And there, of course, there's the Famous Life magazine pictures. Also a model of a battleship. It's a Corvette. Corvette class. There's a PT boat. Now, if you notice, it says PT-109. Those of you who aren't familiar, and I'm old enough because he was my hero when I was a boy, PT-109 was the PT boat that John F. Kennedy served on. And those of you that think the elite rich kids don't go to war, his older brother Joseph was killed in Europe, I believe on a bombing run. And in the South Pacific, John Kennedy, the younger brother, received a very severe back injury but still managed to swim and back and forth and save many of his his friends, his colleagues, his fellow soldiers to go to an island under Japanese attack when his PT boat was blown up. And later in life, he had to take a lot of painkillers, amphetamines and things to keep the pain back. So even as president of the United States, so he was an ultra rich kid. And there's the famous picture, of course, from Life magazine where he, he, he uh, bends the nurse and kisses her. And there's some of the uh, Japanese helmets and guns. That's something, a prop from Saving Private Ryan. There's a lot of movie props in there from several movies. And now you're going to see World War II, of course. Radios, some other things here. It's, it's a really cool place. So now there, there's a... I believe they're called waves. I don't remember the ladies that were in the Air Force. Now, that's a pretty cool jacket. I love to have that leather jacket. My understanding of that leather jacket and the uniform on the left, you'll see the lady's picture in the left-hand corner. Those were hers. And shows a picture of her. She's quite a bit older. She's got to be in her 80s. She's wearing that uniform. It still fit her. Women contributed a lot to World War II, and I don't mean just working in factories. Got to remember, war changes things. And a lot of the ladies that were housewives, so to speak, did what they could for their country. Rosie the Riveter is the famous poster. And without the women, man, look at them on the right there in the pictures. Without the women, we couldn't have got through the, thrown the war. They were just as vital as the soldiers on the field. And it was, uh, it was an amazing time. A lot of death, a lot of suffering, a lot of carnage. And there she is there. And that's her uniform with her picture. It's uh, pretty cool. Very cool, actually. And that's her and her name. And she went along with everything as far as military goes right up to the day she died. And there's some... Weapon, some insignias, some emblems. And we'll go around here. And there's some really cool models, German fighters. There's a lot of German stuff in there. And I'll tell you why there is in a minute. I don't want to ruin it for you. This was a U-boat. Those things were deadly. And that's a picture of it, a model of it, I should say, U-99. Most dreaded U-boat, it was sunk 
It sunk thousands of ships carrying men and material to help Britain in the war before the Americans got it and a little bit after. If you remember, the Americans did not get in World War II until Pearl Harbor. Britain was basically alone, and they held on. It was miraculous. I give it to the, to the English people. Frankly, not to sound like a jerk, but if things, these things happen today, I don't think that the English people have the metal to do it anymore. Politics and liberalism has ruined them. But hopefully, we're never going to find out. And there's some paraphernalia around, some pictures. It's a pretty cool place. There's a cool uniform. That's a nice uniform, pretty sharp. Now, I go around the corner here, you're going to see something really cool. Really cool. And there is a, that's a real German flag. And as you're going to see as I zoom in on it, that it's all signed. Sorry about my finger. It's all signed there by Americans. Where they're from, what city, Ohio, Brooklyn, Detroit, and that's the real deal. That's a real Nazi flag captured and signed on by all the Americans that were there. Maine, it's uh, really, really something to see that stuff. Sorry about the camera work, but I'm not as good as Matt Hogue. He's a professional but I do my best. And there's one there from New York. It's uh, some pretty, pretty cool stuff there in a very small place. They had it very well displayed. Connecticut, Nebraska. There's a German uniform on the left. And it just shows. Now, the reason why all this was here is because, believe it or not, Crossville had a, they call it an internment camp on that exchange there, but they had a POW camp right outside of Crossville. And this is what sh they used the commissary for the prisoners to buy things. Now, remember, this is farm country. This is in the 1940s. It was a huge labor shortage, especially men. So these, now this was a prisoner of war camp for German and Italian officers only. And from what the tour guide said, the Italians and the German officers did not get along at all. But they would have it so they could work on farms. And they were making not great money, but decent money. And you got to remember, they were, they were Germans. And... They wanted to get out. It'd be like working on a road crew today. And they were paid. And they used this to buy things in the commissary. POW Camp Canteen. You can see all the different denominations and all the numbers that are on it. And that's all actual, I call it script. Camp Canteen in Crossfield, Tennessee. Now you're going to see something very cool here in a second. That's coming up. That somebody made concerning the prisoner of war camp. And there's some pictures with the Germans, and that's an actual tombstone of a German that died. I believe they only said they had one or two that died. None escaped. Why would they bother? And then there it is there. Now, that is a scale model of the prison, POW, internment camp, whatever you want to call it, right outside of Crossville. And that's made to scale, is my understanding, and that's very well done. Very well done. I mean, look at that. A gentleman made that, I'm not sure how long ago, donated it to the museum. And that's really cool. Very cool stuff. And uh, I was looking at it, and it was really neat. And it has all the markings, you know, where the officer where the Italian world of trains were, where, the, where everything was. And there's a picture there of some of the uh, prisoners. 
That was probably really easy duty for the American guards. It just sat there. I mean, they didn't go anywhere. As you can see, there's the post exchange. That's the map. That's the mail. That's the post office. Italian officer prisoners, which were separate. Germans didn't think much of the Italians, honestly. And there's an authentic. I don't know if that's a replica of a Nazi flag. Those are some medals, and there's a picture of General Rommel, the Desert Fox. It was part of the plot to kill Hitler, so he had to kill himself to save his family. Now, there's a picture there. A German soldier revisits Crossville. My understanding from the tour guide is that at the end of the war, many of the German prisoners wanted to stay. Why the hell did they want to go back to their country? Most of it was in ruins. And they loved America, and they loved Crossville area. And I guess that wasn't so uncommon for prisoners of war that were in America. They wanted to stay. And the U.S. government said, absolutely not. The next day, when the war ended, they were put on a train, put on a boat, and said to Germany, if they wanted to come back and apply for citizenship, honestly... I might have let him stay and apply for citizenship, but hindsight's twenty twenty. And there's a picture there of a gentleman that was visiting Crossville who was a former prisoner of war. Gunther Burns. And that's his daughter-in-law. And it's really fascinating stuff. Here's some more pictures. Those are authentic officer helmets. I should say... Uh, not helmets, but hats. That looks Russian, to be honest with you, but it might be German. And soldiers of the Commonwealth. And some other miscellaneous items. Very cool place. Very cool pictures. And as we move on, once we get past World War II here, we're getting a little bit of Korea. There's where Stalin dies after 29 year rule. And that pretty much covers the military museum. Now, it was a really cool place. If you ever go to Crossville or near Crossville, I would suggest it highly, 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 highly that you visit that. Uh, they have set days, uh, set hours during the week. I think they're closed on Monday or Sunday and Monday. I'm not sure. It's all volunteer. So you have to look on the sign out front. I believe they said it was 9 to 4. Monday through Saturday, I'm not sure. You'll have to double check the military museum in a crossfield. You can look it up on the Internet easy enough. And I went there twice, and there was some very cool stuff. And when you see this stuff in person, it has much more of an impact on you. And now, now, now you know why they call Tennessee the volunteer state. As a, as a percent of volunteers in war, Tennessee, I believe, has the highest percent of volunteers per population. Two Medal of Honor, or I guess there were several Medal of Honor winners from Cumberland County, and for a county that small, especially back then, that's a big deal. Most of them were farm people, farm boys, that became men very quickly. And saw things that you and I couldn't even dream about. And when they came back, shattered a lot of them, they were treated as heroes. And I think I'm not putting down the veterans of today. I'm not at all. I think men back then were different. They held things in. Some of the psychological damage that was done from the war, I think they kept to themselves because it was the manly thing to do. And today, they're a little more open about it. They have a lot more help through counseling and other things through the VA. But nonetheless, all of the men through the Middle Eastern conflicts, all the way through the American Revolution, we owe. And it's a debt we can never pay back. Never. And those of you that want to spit on the flag, they want to burn the flag, like that trans BMX rider 
wants to burn it if she, if she, he is on the podium. Go to Arlington National Cemetery. Go to the beaches in Normandy and see that cemetery. And as far as the eye can see are white stones to preserve and protect our country and keep the world, Europe especially, free from tyranny. And those men and women gave the ultimate sacrifice what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion by giving up their lives for their country. Think about that the next time you're critical. And until the next time, folks, goodbye and good luck.